So this is part three in the last video of this series, but it is by far the most important. As a clinician and combat athlete myself, I care deeply about making sure that all of you out there can train healthy and in turn perform better. In part one of this series, we learned how CTE comes about and even how it affects the brain. And in part two, we explored the mind numbing statistics of CTE and in combat sports. This final video will give you guidelines on how to train in order to minimize your risk for brain injury and potentially developing CTE later on in life. Some of which will include a deep dive into the literature on some pretty controversial questions like whether or not to wear headgear or what type of gloves to wear and then a bonus idea at the end to help potentially further reduce your risk of brain injuries. So the first of these guidelines is broken down into two categories the intensity of training and the pros and cons of each and then how often to train at these intensities. So let's look at training intensity and what we really mean by that is sparring intensity. We have this split into light sparring and hard sparring. Let's start with light sparring and give the pros and cons. So light sparring obviously affords you the ability to focus on technique while significantly minimizing your risk for head injury. Injury. It also allows you to spar more often, arguably helping you improve your craft and not having to worry about fully recovering from session to session. The obvious cons are that you're really not training your reaction time since you're moving slower and accuracy can be sacrificed. Since accuracy can only truly be tested under full speed conditions from a fully resisting opponent. Conversely, we have hard or full speed sparring, which is without question unmatched when it comes to training reaction time and accuracy. Not to mention that it's about as close as one can get to mimicking a real fight, being that both are fully resisting opponents. The glaring issue is is that the risk of developing CTE later on in life increases significantly, since hard sparring often involves taking multiple shots to the head, even though they may not be enough to cause a concussion, which we learned in my first two videos of this series, are thought to be the main culprit in the development of CTE. And even if you manage to get out of a hard sparring session without taking many headshots, it takes much more time to recover from full effort sessions, potentially decreasing the amount that you can train over time. So here are my general recommendations for training intensity and frequency with one caveat. Hard sparring should account for no more than 10% of your total sparring training. Light sparring being at 90% of your training or above. For example, let's say that you usually spar once a week. That's 10 sparring sessions every two and a half months. This would put you at one training session at that full intensity during those two and a half months. Listen, I know that's not much, but remember there's literally nothing good that can come from taking multiple shots to the head, even if they don't cause symptoms. But I will say this because I used to do this when I wanted to spar hard a little bit more often. You and your sparring partner could come to the agreement that even if you guys are going really close to 100% to only strike from the neck down. This will still give your body the feel for taking leg kicks, body shots, etc. You can still work your kicks up to shoulder height and still give your partner some pretty realistic looks when they're checking high kicks without worrying about the head trauma. Now the downside is that your boxing isn't worked as well as it could be. And admittedly, my boxing is not where it should be right now. But you can still get some pretty damn good boxing work with mitts. And now for the first controversial question. Will it help if you wear headgear? This is a very tough question to answer, particularly because there's conflicting evidence that exists. So we're all probably aware of the Amateur International Boxing Association's decision to ban headgear in 2013. This was a huge point of contention. The AIBA's decision was based on arguments that headgear provided boxers with a false sense of security, causing them to take more risks in the ring. This recent review of the literature looked at all the available evidence that met their inclusion criteria related to this topic specifically, and it doesn't seem to be as straightforward as the AIBA is claiming it to be. I mean, don't get me wrong, some of the literature exists to support their claims. For example, Davis et al. found that after the 2013 rule change, boxers throw and land less punches, defensive movement increased, and the number of standing counts was reduced reduced from 9% to 3%. The main conclusion from the authors in this study was that the behavioral changes are what will likely make the biggest impact in the reduction of brain injury. However, that exact same study found that there was actually an increase in knockouts and TKOs within the same time frame. And as far as if headgear actually protects against concussive forces, the literature is not clear on that either. While it definitely protects against facial lacerations and bruises, and potentially reduces the impact of linear blows to the head, it remains unclear as to whether headgear can protect against the rotational forces that are now known to have a causative relationship with brain injury. And to add another part into this already hard to solve puzzle, the type of headgear may play a role as well, including the material, the design, and the size of the headgear. So whether or not the aggregate findings of all of these studies warrant the banning of headgear is unclear. But here's what I will say. Most of the time, if we wanna make a real change in the world in a preventative way with most of the aspects of our lives, it really comes down to a behavioral change. This is not me endorsing not wearing headgear. That's not what I'm saying at all. In my mind, the absolute ideal situation 
situation seems to be something like this. First, start realizing right now that you and who you are literally resides in your brain and it should be protected at all costs. And second, headgear can probably only help you if you've adopted this mindset. I realize that psychologically without headgear, we can't just switch our brains into protective mode. The removal of the headgear likely triggers something really deep within us that makes us fight more defensively. However, if we can get into that mindset already, that plus headgear would seem to be the ideal situation. Let me know what you think in the comments. You can still be aggressive and trained really hard without irresponsibly putting yourself in a shitty situation. And now for the second controversial question. What type of gloves do I use? You'll probably be surprised to know that there's very little direct evidence on this. Other than one study on bare knuckle fighting, that only reported three concussions out of 141 fights studied, which isn't enough to draw any real conclusions from, other than that fighters may be less inclined to throw hard punches due to increased risk of cuts, scrapes, and injuries to their teeth. But I did come across this book called Fight Like a Physicist by Jason Talkin, who has his PhD in computational condensed matter physics and is a mixed martial artist, including a black belt in Hapkido. So I bought the book and read it so you didn't have to. And although there's really not a lot of peer-reviewed evidence included, his expertise in physics can help us understand this dilemma. He states that when it comes to larger gloves, they're good for dispersing energy throughout a larger surface area, which leads to greater protections against cuts, bruises, swelling, etc. However, the increased surface area does not affect momentum. This means that the amount that the head moves after the blow is relatively unaffected which makes sense. The brain is actually going to move and shift inside the skull the same regardless of what size glove you're using. Of course, given that all other variables are equal, suggesting that glove size wouldn't really matter much when we're talking about the axonal damage that happens at the brain that we learned about in the first video. In fact, later he states that a larger glove during a glancing blow or rotational blow to the head may actually increase the transfer of momentum to the head. Again, this is all theoretical and to my knowledge has not been directly researched, so take that as you will. But theoretically, it seems that glove type really doesn't matter all that much, especially when the transfer of momentum is concerned. And that's our main focus regarding brain injury. So in summary, before we hit the bonus tip, here are the recommendations. Limit your hard sparring to less than 10% of your overall sparring training. Do your best to adopt the mindset that you are not invincible and make a decision based off of your fighting style whether or not to wear headgear. Since the evidence is unclear as to whether headgear actually protects from brain injury or not, it remains your choice whether to wear it. And the type of glove you wear, based off of theory alone, doesn't really seem to matter all that much regarding how much the brain actually moves in the skull. But if if you want to protect against cuts and bruising, larger gloves are the better option. Now the bonus tip that anyone can do to reduce your risk for brain injury that some of you may have already heard, and that is to make your neck as strong as possible. There are several studies across different sports that have discovered that increased neck muscular strength mitigates the magnitude of head acceleration with blows to the head in certain sporting activities like heading the ball in soccer or getting tackled in football. This is thought to lessen the amount of movement of the brain in the skull, potentially reducing the risk for injury. And I have a video that I posted way back on how to get started with strengthening your neck without any equipment. These progressions will help you get started and I'll link the video in the description. And I'm also going to be doing another video on some more advanced neck strengthening exercises sometime in the near future. I think if this video has shed light on anything, it's that there's really not a lot of research that directly looks at any of this, which is a shame because it's probably the most important information for the people who train day in and day out. Remember guys, make sure you're training healthy so that you can in turn perform better when the time comes. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time.